in this space webinar series. Um, as a Space Solutions Portugal, uh, this year organized every month uh, a, a webinar dedicated to some specific topic um, of interest for our startups and for our network. This month uh, and this November month, we have a very special invitee, and I would like first of all to acknowledge and thank Jose Anton from ANI, our Portuguese National Innovation Agency, for telling us and for inviting us to organize this webinar with Sir. Um, from CERN, we have Ash Ravi Kumar. Uh, he will introduce himself much better than, than, than I. Um, uh, he, he will present us with something I think it's of interest of, of, of the audience. And of course, we have here Tiago Neves from Fibersight. Uh, we, we have this, we are fortunate to have a, a certain startup founded here in, 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 in Coimbra, in Portugal. Uh, and uh, Tiago is incubated here in our As a Big Portugal program. So, um, this uh, As, a, As a Space Solutions Portugal is promoted by IPN, Instituto Pedro Nunes in Coimbra. And we are part of this large As a Space Solutions network that involves involves the VIX, the business incubation centers, the ambassadors network, and the technology brokers also. So we think there is a, a nice match and a, a, um, a nice opportunity to understand better what is the CERN, this new CERN Venture Connect that Ash Ravi Kumar will uh, introduce us. So without further ado, I will give the, the screen to Ash. Thank you, Ash, and go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Carla. Uh, thank you, Jose, for organizing this, um, uh, connecting us. It's, it's brilliant to talk with you all um, and, and to, to talk with Diego after some time as well. So quick introduction. My name is Ashravi Kumar, I'm originally from India. I've been working with Sun for about four years now. Um, I take care of all things startups, how uh, either startups that come out of Sun, um, like Founders like uh, Thiago, uh, you know, uh, who think about doing their startup with the tech that they work on here, and also startups that don't exist outside of CERN, where we can give CERN technology so they can go to market faster. So uh, we just recently joined, uh, launched three months back our new program called CERN Venture Connect. Um, I'll give you more details on why we did it and what we do, so that, um, uh, and then we can talk more about. Um, questions later uh, and after Thiago's presentation. So I'll go for my slide uh, show. Um, let me know if you can see it. All good. I can't see other people now. Oops. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. Ash. You, you can, can go uh, ahead. Yeah. Thank okay, you. good. Thank you. All right. So, uh, so on Venture Connect, uh, this is a program, flagship uh, entrepreneurship program, where we're putting everything around this um, to support startups. Um, before I go more into CERN Venture Connect, I wanted to give you an idea about what is CERN. Um, most folks have heard about CERN, but not necessarily understand the scale and the depth of what we do at CERN. So CERN is home of the world's largest machine. Um, that is a large Hadron Collider, um, LHC, large because it's 27 kilometers in circumference. Hadrons because we play with the Hadrons group and accelerate protons. Collider because we collide them. Um, and it collides into four places that you see on the big white uh, letters, ALICE, ATLAS, CMS, and LHCB. These are our four major experiments. Uh, we call it experiments, but in necessarily what are the, those are detectors where the particles come and collide there. And then we, we see uh, what happens or what experiments we can run with them. Uh, these are 100 meters down. And um, just to give you on scale of how they look, this is ATLAS. Uh, this was taken. This photograph was taken when uh, it was being built. The four, uh, the eight uh, magnets or the toroidal magnets inside uh, will be the the center midpoint is where you see the particle beams there. Just to give you the scale of it, there is a person standing there um, to see how big these detectors are. This is CMS, compact muon solenoid. Oh, sorry. Previously, uh, Atlas was where Higgs boson um, uh, research was done. This experiment led to the finding of the Higgs boson. This is CMS, compact muon solenoid. Um, there's nothing compact about it, but this was the first time they built a magnet this size uh, compactly. Uh, this, the pipe you see in the middle is where the beams go and everything around it is to either control the beams or detectors um, and sensors to find out what happened to the particles after the collision. The third one, this is called ALICE. 
Um, uh, the big red doors you see are all magnets. It takes a long time to open and close them. But this looks at what happens to the, the gluon uh, plasma uh, research. And so I'll touch a little bit more about it. This is the third one. Last one is a lot, uh, the LHC B, um, LHC Beauty, um, where this is actually a, um, a vertical detector rather than the cylindrical ones that you saw. So that's to give you a scale of how big things are at CERN. Why do we do it? Um, so this is kind of history of the universe. So bear with me. This is the only part where I'm going to talk about physics and uh, Big Bang. Um, so what we see is, you know, from zero to 10 power minus 30 seconds of, uh, of a second, where the inflation happened and then the protons were formed, but we don't know what happened in that time, right? So where we are today is 13.8 billion years later, where we try to see what happened before and why were protons formed, what happened in the nuclear fusion area, uh, and when it began and when it ended before the cosmic microwave background was created. So everything is after the Big Bang, zero to 10 power minus 32 seconds. That's where we like to see, understand what are the quantum fluctuations, why were particles, how do, why did they behave, why did the protons form, atoms form, et cetera. Another way to visualize this is the, the time warp around it. You know, on the other end is where the space applications look at it from the James Webb telescope. If you think about it, the light waves come from other um, universe we you know it takes a long time to come so you look at it outside we focus more on the other extreme where we look at the big bang and saying what happened to these um particles so that's where we focus on that's where the 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 space one goes in but to give a continuum of what we do so this is all great what are we talking about startups um so just to give you a little bit of background we had a business incubation center network uh, which is also called BIX. Um, and then obviously we were compared a lot to ESA BIC. And that's not why we changed. Um, the, 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 the challenges with the BIX were it was set up in a way that it wasn't scalable to all of our member states. Um, so CERN is uh, funded by 23 member states and eight associate member states. There's about 31 countries. And we can't scale the same service to all of these countries and have the same service level and partners there. So we had to go and redesign uh, because we are two people in the entrepreneurship team and it's going to say two people because, you know, we want to, um, CERN's now going to spend more resources to make the startups happen here because that's not what we are, what we should be investing on. So, so given the constraints, how do we build a program that's equitable and, um, and can scale? So we went to back to design of the whole program. We started with the first principle, right? Who do we focus on? Who should we build this program for? And it starts with the startup founders and everything we do has to be for the entrepreneur in the middle. Um, and then draw everything from there rather than putting constraints on there. So we started with the founders and said, okay, every startup founder has three needs. They all want money um, and they would need expertise in terms of co-founders, in terms of employees, in terms of mentors on manufacturing, um, who can help them go, you know, make introductions to potential customers. So that mentor network. And then customers, most of our stuff ends up into business to business deals and deep tech startups, by definition, you're not going to sell to a customer unless you make a um, little widget. Um, so 90% of it is going to be a large company which has to buy this product from the startup. So we, you know, you will have to end up selling to those customers. So the startup founder has these three big buckets that we looked at and then said, okay, where does CERN play is the technology. We're good at technology. We love our technology and we should because we invented it. But that's where we play and not in the other three parts. So, you know, looking at the needs, we can give the technology. So then we plan, you know, mapped it and saying the folks with the money are the venture capitalists um, and incubators who can do the seed investment, mentors. Uh, we tapped into our CERN alumni network. We have about 8,000 people who are the CERN alumni globally spread. And they are, um, you know, that network is phenomenal primarily because um, uh, there are folks who are, you know, um, the first employees of LinkedIn to, to startup founders, to experts that you can't find outside. And they are really, really awesome on how they give back to the community. So we reach out to that network. And plus the network of suppliers, people who we work with, licenses that we have. So that's the network that we tap on for mentors and also for large companies that we reach out and, you know, both either supply CERN or we've had relationships with. So that's where the network that we started looking at mapping and who can who can help the founders address those three needs. 
So from CERN's perspective, right? So how do we optimize internally? So we, I got a CERN technology, you're a startup founder, you're an entrepreneur. We give you technology and the knowledge transfer to say, hey, this is the tech, this is how it works. Here, go build for your use case. And the, the startup pays back royalty for the use of technology. That's pretty much the simplistic trans uh, 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 transaction, if you want to put it that way. And it's enabled by a license agreement, which is a legal agreement which tells you, you have now have the rights to make, use, and sell this product in this field, in this territory. And, and for that grant of that license, you're going to give me royalty back. It sounds simplistic, but the problem is with any legal document, it takes time. Um, and and with a large organization, it takes a lot longer to get it. And with this, the clock speed of what CERN works and where the startups want, there was always a mismatch. I mean, most of the crowd is probably startup founders. You want it done yesterday, but for us, it'll take six months is a very good um, um, uh, outcome. But then there's so much of that mismatch and we always ended up having bad feelings of, oh, this was very slow. So we needed to go optimize the internal part. So the entire program was built on how do we optimize time? And so this is a simplistic form, um, um, uh, overview of a program. And I'll go more into details about it. So Sun Venture Connect is in the middle. Um, we hold a technology portfolio that we've, qualified within CERN, and I'll give you more on how we picked and selected the technologies. We have all of the information about the technology there, and a startup founder, you can be small, big, you know, you could be Series A level, you could be a scale up. Um, you apply to CERN for CERN Venture Connect. It's a one-page application, which has got six questions to say, what are you the, what's the technology that you're interested in? How are you going to use it? What's your technical risks right now? And how do you plan to mitigate it? So at least it'll give us an idea what you're trying to build. Um, and then we have a first call with the startup founders to say, okay, that's great. You know, Let's talk more about what do you want? How can we help you? And once we select them, um, we it's a standard licensing agreement that we've put together, uh, which is the same for whether you use hardware, software, you put your name and sign the agreement, we are done. And as a process, we also will give you free prototypes. Uh, I'll tell you more about why we've come up with the free prototypes. Um, and so that's where we optimize the internal delays of how we can move things faster for the startups. And then the outside with VCs, mentors, and large companies is always that time delay of you going and cold emailing or using a brilliant uh, incubator network who can help you and make those introductions. So in essence, we are no different. You know, we reached out to the best VCs in deep tech who have vertical focus. For example, we signed up three people who VCs whose investment thesis is only on photonics, um, and three who do, do a lot of semiconductor investments. So that changes the dynamics. They understand how long it will take. They'll introduce you to fabs to make your chips and also get their network to help you push towards um, a manufacturing. Um, so we picked and choose which VCs we want to work with. Uh, mentors, as I said, it's our alumni network and personal network that we use. Large companies as well, we've signed a few. Um, so right now we have 18 signed agreements uh, with partners, 20 in the process of signature. And 20, I said support is because some of these large companies says, look, by the time I go with this contract on a partnership agreement, it will take six months. Let's put that in the process, but I'll still support you. Um, by the time this uh, contract comes in, but till then, let's just talk. And I said, brilliant, let's talk. As long as you help the founder, it doesn't matter whether you sign or not. So, but our hope is to get them also on board. So that's pretty much the CERN Venture Connect in a step. So we had a platform, we pick the technologies, give it to the founders and connect to the VCs that and folks with, who can either help with um, money, um, uh, people, or distribution. So that's pretty much our big team, and that's how this whole program came into place. Um, more into details about the technologies and 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 how we structured inside. Um, so CERN has, if you, I tell this to all the startups I talk to, if you give me any technical challenge, I can find an expert inside of CERN. Right, so we've got a breadth of people who know a lot about a lot of things. Um, however, the challenge comes into having them being available to talk to you, um, and, uh, and consistently is where the challenge happens. Right, and second, 
Um, I'm going in the reverse uh, uh, on the unique clear IP title and support available. Clear IP title, by watch I mean, um, like for example, when I showed you the Atlas experiment, there are 320 universities associated with that experiment. So if I have a piece of IP, they probably will have five other people associated with it who are not CERN. And so I need to have an agreement with all of those five universities so that I can license that to a startup. I don't want to have that negotiation start when a startup is interested because I don't know how long that will take. Rather, I wanted to have technologies where that is already solved, right? I've got a clear IP title to saying I can give you the license. I've got the right to grant you license or it's CERN only IP. So we have clarity to saying that I have that. And the last part, which is most important part, is something that's unique, right? I.e., you can't find this technology somewhere else. Um, when I go to the digital portfolio of ours, we've got one of these brilliant database management system where every data, I mean, excess scale amount of data of every experiment of CERN is stored, right? And it's a brilliant open source technology. But from a startup, why would you want to use that instead of Amazon Web Services where you can go get support? Here it's an open source. I don't know when people can help you or it's scalable for your needs. It is a possibility, but it's not necessarily unique in the market. You have an alternative in the in the um, in, in the market who can actually buy for it. And if it doesn't work, you can pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm paying you. Why are you not fixing it? But we can't do not saying that root is not a great software. It's brilliant, but it's not fit for purpose. So we picked and chose technologies which are world class that nothing else like that exists. I want to spend a little bit more about the standard licensing agreement, right? So we've got the agreement which is common for everyone and um, for a startup or um, whether they're using hardware or software. And um, our, start, our startup support policy, CERN's policy states that we will give preferential treatment to startups, which is great. We want to support startups, but the challenge was we never defined what was a preferential licensing arrangement. It could be three years of free licensing. It could be, you know, you pay royalties when you when you get a mark, when you get to product, um, and then what would be the royalty rate, right? And it was always a challenge because it was not, you know, I mean, I might think, you know, two percent is good. If you ask somebody else, they'll think ten percent is good. So it was always subjective, and that adds to another level of delight. So we said we're never going to standardize everything because law of averages, you will make money on some, you lose money on some, and either way, we are not optimized to make money. So our our contract says if it is a patentable technology or not open source, it's two percent royalty. And if it is open source, it's 1% and it's only um, capped at 50,000 Swiss francs, but that's an asterisk, uh, it's lesser than that. It's this. So a 2% royalty rate on net sales. However, you don't pay the money as a startup to CERN till you actually owe us 20,000 in royalties. So if you do the reverse calculation, you should be doing 1 million Swiss francs in sales for you to pay us 20,000 Swiss francs. Um, this way, we are setting up those startups for success. And when you are making a million in sales and deep tech, you're really, really, I think, cross the threshold of um, um, uh, being stable. And, you know, we want you to pay only when you get there. And, you know, this could take a year. This could take two years. It could never happen. But we still want to make sure that you've got the rights to do it. And, you know, if you end up paying us 20,000 every month, which means that you're doing a million in sales every month, which is a fantastic problem to have. Now, we got some internal funding for this uh, CVC program. Um, we, and we're using half of the money to make prototypes to give it to those startups to say, here's a prototype so that you can do it. Uh, I'll give you more about this. And the 50% to saying more technologies internally that could be ready for the CVC program. So that in funding is all for internal. We can't invest in any startups just because of a structure, and we don't. We, I don't. We don't think we are good at making those investment decisions either way. And for the partner requirements, all we ask them is, hey, if you find a good startup, let us know. Promote the CVC program because primarily most of our um, partners who are either incubators, VCs, or um, support services around there, they are a lot more connected to the startup uh, ecosystem. I'm sitting here in Geneva. I have no idea how the the ecosystem in Cumbra is. So you would all probably know a lot more about it. And so we want those partners to, to tell about CVC and ask startups to apply. And 
and from the VCs, we don't say, hey, you have to invest in these startups. All we ask is give us give the startup founders time so that they can have a first meeting with you and give feedback on saying why you're in not investing, not the same story of you're too early, no traction, you know, too late and all of that. Rather saying if you attach uh, uh, these milestones, we'll, uh, we'll invest. These are the risks that we see. At least you help the startup founders. And so the partners we've signed up are all within that um, thing. Last about the technology. So this is one of the technology which is not on our website, which is going to come in a week. Uh, which I'm super excited about. This is called Accurate ASIC. Um, is an application-specific integrated circuit. It's a chip that can measure the smallest of currents. Uh, it can measure femtoamps, that's 10 power minus 15 of an amp, to attoamperes, 10 power minus 20 amps. Um, the, the, there is an equivalent product in the market which cost a few hundred thousand dollars to, to do the same. We know it because we bought one and tested if this was measuring the same. This costs about you know um, 10 euros to make. So there's a huge shift in there. This was developed by our radio protection group because if a particle comes and hits a detector, it produces a really feeble current. So we use it for measuring if there was radiation. There's going to be full development on this, on the new chip on Acura 3, but this there. So the prototypes part of it is if I give you a chip now as a startup, you're coming and say, hey, look, I've got an application to measure these very small currents. Um, if I don't give you a chip, you have to go to a fab to figure out how, how to make this chip, which will cost you anywhere between half a million to a million euros to actually start developing that. Instead, if I give you a chip, you still have to develop a PCB, figure out how you're doing the power controllers, how you're putting a microcontroller or an FPGA, and then the software to measure it and run it. So, but also is not helpful for startups because then you have to invest money in to do that, which you already don't have. So what we said was, we'll put money in to the team here to saying, build me 20 of these boards with the chip in, with the display, input, output. So if you're a startup to saying, hey, I'm gonna use this to measure for my biomedical device or whatever that you want to do on this, um, smallest current, we'll give you a chip. If you select you, we'll say, hey, here's a board, plug it in to saying if your proof of concept works. And then talk to the partners in a venture network to saying, hey, look, they've got a really cool investment uh, opportunity here because a startup, good founders, we give the technology, they've done a proof of concept, they need money to actually scale this up and go talk with their customers or at least they're validated. Would you be interested? So that's pretty much how we want to progress this. I think I'm almost up in time, but I'll finish up last two slides. So one of our partners is Microsoft uh, 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 for startups, founders of program. Um, they're coming here on the 30th of October. Uh, the registration link is there and hope Carla can put it in the in the group or you, you will see this. Um, um, it's online. Uh, uh, it's to invite folks from Microsoft because Microsoft does Microsoft Quantum, High Performance Compute, OpenAI, um, they bought a GitHub. So a lot more expertise lies in Microsoft on how they can help you on scale. Um, we've got two startups already from our portfolio in them. So they're going to come and tell you how good they are, um, the startups, um, rather than Microsoft telling how good they are, which they are. <laughs> um, but it's more to be aware of what's in the ecosystem. So just like how this webinar is to saying, by the way, Sun's doing this. Our job is to saying, by the way, we partnered with Microsoft. They're doing all of this great stuff. You don't have to come to us to get to them. This is happening in the ecosystem. So um, uh, if you're interested, register. We're going to record it and we'll share it too. Plus, obrigado. Thank you. And um, I'll stop here and questions. I'll be back. Okay, thank you, Ash. It was very nice. Uh, I myself will have a couple of questions, uh, probably more in the end. I think uh, after your presentation, it would be nice to have now Tiago um, showcasing his his his, uh, his product based on a CERN technology. So Tiago, welcome here to this space webinar with us. It, it, it's very interesting to, to now see in practice how this can come together and learn a little bit about uh, your experience. So Tiago, uh, the screen is yours. Okay, so hello everyone. So first of all, thanks Carla and the, the rest of the team for organizing this webinar and also for inviting me to to give my testimonial. Before starting my presentation, I would just like to say that Ash probably is one of the reasons why I'm here today. 
because it was it started off curiosity, but uh, three years ago, four years ago, when I was a PhD student, Ash was the first or the second person that I contact to know what he thinks about it. And he was the first to say, okay, let me study technology and then give you the feedback. And after a couple of hours, he said, okay, Tiago, you should go ahead. We have here, you have our support. So let's do it. And let's, uh, I hope you, you have some, some luck. And I was like, okay, so thanks Ash for your support. And uh, I will now share my screen. <coughs> Sorry, not this one. This presentation. So do you see my full screen presentation? So yeah, so I, actually I'm the, the founder of Fiversight. Um, Fiversight is a company that uh, that was born at CERN. Um, it was created before this program that Ash presented was launched, but uh, resulted from my PhD uh, that I that I did in collaboration between CERN and EPFL. EPFL is the Swiss, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, and the company currently is based in Coimbra, uh, where we are at least the IPN and, and me are settled down, and then it was founded in 2021. So currently we are focused on developing optical fiber sensors. That was something that I was developing during my PhD. And our main objective is to turn the optical fibers into sensors to fill the environment. Uh, of course, it involves uh, optoelectronics, photonics, uh, software, and more recently, artificial intelligence. And in the last couple of years, we started to have different partners from, from Sweden, from Italy, from Portugal, from Spain. And also, we got involved in different uh, European projects um, from the European Commission, from Photonub, and more recently, uh, the incubation program here at uh, IPN. So. But let me start from the beginning. So the, the, my PhD started in 2017 and all the tests that I was performing and all the, the, the laboratory experiment was uh, in Lausanne, that is more or less one hour away from, from CERN. And as a student, I was almost traveling every day uh, back and forth to make all the experiments possible at APFL. And when I got the first uh, light at the end of the tunnel, it was in 2019, um, I got some good results that really motivate me, me and my supervisor at that time to go further. And at that moment, we didn't have an optical laboratory at test. I have to go to EPFL almost every day. And, uh, and then I will explain you why CERN was important. But then in 2021, after all the support, I managed to, to settle down the company uh, even before my PhD. And since 2021, we got different projects like uh, I said before. But I, I think now it's important to focus in this 2019, 2020, because when I was a PhD student, uh, COVID hit all of us, so it was in 2020. And by the middle of 2020, I was exactly starting my experiment at uh, APFL, and everything stopped. And at the same time, my, my scholarship was about to end in a couple of months. And then my, superv my supervisor told me something like, OK, Tiago, now we have a problem because you cannot go to CERN, you cannot go to the laboratory, and Probably you don't have extra funding for your last year. And then someone like rang the bell. OK, there's a, a department at CERN called Knowledge Transfer Group that, first of all, help different researchers to develop something at CERN, but most important, to transfer it to, from CERN to the industry. And I applied for the first time to this CERN Knowledge Transfer Fund. And, of, uh, and, and I was selected as the, for the first time. And this first grant helped me first to, to build an optical laboratory at CERN that we didn't have at all, that allowed me to go every day and every night to, to make all the experiments that I need, but also to have one year extra of my PhD that, uh, that I was under stress uh, in the different uh, country. And then it really relaxed me a lot and motivated me to go further. And then the results were so good that in 2021, after I found the company, there was a new opportunity to apply again for the, this knowledge transfer group already under the, the not the supervision, but the support of Ash. Uh, he said, but now we, are, we really want to invest in, in startups. We really want to, to go further with this process because before it was a bit a mess and they were supporting some researchers, but there was no a clear line to move to the industry. And then I apply again for this uh, CERN knowledge transfer fund and I got selected again, and it was really important because with this new grant, I, I got nine more months of fellowship wh while I was already working and, and uh, launching the startup. And additionally, I, I managed to, to build a new prototype. 
something that I could transport it from CERN to Portugal from to different countries because before I was I was using an optical table and I could not just transport tons and tons of hardware and also really important to subcontract different engineers mostly software engineers to help me to turn something that I was doing in the large oscilloscope and a large computer in something uh, small and fast and uh, this was really important because uh, as a, as a founder at the beginning most of the founders have problems with grants and with funding and, and CERN and all sorts of group helped me twice to really go further and to have something uh, visible but last but not least uh, all the support from from Ash and from his team uh, the entrepreneurship support because I was a, a PhD student I I, I knew nothing about business, about uh, about uh, entrepreneurship, and Hash was the one that okay, let's go for a coffee, and he gave me a lot of business advices, helped me to prepare the business model, the canvas, all these entrepreneurship words that we all know. But at the same time, I started to have some some interest from different companies in the technology, from different companies in the in collaboration, and Hash was also an advisor here because he was helping me to negotiate, to understand how much should I ask for this and how much. And this was, was really important for, for the, for the FiberSide project, project and FiberSide company. So also to, 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 to collaborate with what Ash said, this is something that CERN does really well. And I think it's really important for the society to understand, to understand that what the researchers do there is not only collide particles, it's also something important is this is the place where the internet was created and so on and uh, all together i managed to have my first project that my first product let's say that is the fiber loop so fiber loop is something that was born in my PhD because i was monitoring temperature and humidity in uh, in one of the CERN detectors atlas with optical fiber sensors and then i realized that this can be used outside the industry and right now we have the first temperature and humidity sensor that use optical fibers with a single acquisition unit you can go for more than 25 kilometers per channel and we monitor temperature humidity which means that we can use it in different industries for example the agriculture and in the agriculture we installing optical fibers we can help the farmers to understand if they need to irrigate more or if the soil is already irrigated and they can save water also in civil engineering because actually civil engineering was where everything started because cern is a large complex system of tunnels and uh, and caverns and uh, and they use a lot of water to cure the concrete and they most of the times they don't really know what's happening inside the concrete and the last part of my phd was embed some meters of fiber inside a block of concrete to monitor the temperature and humidity to help us to understand when the concrete was fully cured and when it was ready for the next step of, of construction. More recently, we also get some projects with energy, with uh, most specifically detecting hot spots in the in the power cables and also detecting uh, points where where the humidity uh, is, is is really high and can can lead to some electrical discharges. But the, 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 the project that we are now more focused on is the water leak detection because we all know the problem of the water leaks and without installing optical fibers close to the pipes, we can actually monitor points where the stress can cause damages to the structure, positions where the, the water is leaking, and even intrusions because we can somehow detect vibrations. Last, in large structures like dams or even breaches, we can also detect infiltrations. So, and the good thing of fiber loop is that the same technology can have different uh, or multiple uh, implementations in different use cases. To finish my presentation, we are still a startup, so we are always looking for partnership and investors. Partnerships, as I told you, we have looking for different use cases and investors. We are now starting to discuss with some uh, with some investors to really increase the team and and push forward the, the, the fiber group project and also help us in the internationalization. To finish, I think that it's, it's it was it was really curious when Carol invited me for for this webinar because. Ash was uh, was let's say the mentor of of this project at the beginning, and when when I heard that you he will be giving a seminar, I was quite okay. Let's come back three years and remember our discussions in the cafeteria of CERN. And uh, and uh, so Ash, thanks a lot, thanks a lot for your support for CERN support, and also Carla for for inviting me again. So thanks a lot. No, we, we thank you, uh, Tiago, for, for being here and for giving your testimonial. I think things get a little much more vivid and concrete when we can show 
an, a, a, an example, a real example of how things happen. Um, so uh, we, 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 we have much time. We can, we can open the, the mic or the chat box for questions. Everyone that is attending can, can um, open the mic or, or um, write a question in the, in the chat box. Um, so uh, uh, in the meanwhile, if, if no one uh, says anything, I, can, I, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, I've been, I've been, I'm not a tech person, uh, the persons who know me know that, but for those who don't know me, I'm not, I'm not techy, not, not, not even close, <laughs> closer, um, but um, I, I went to, to, to your, to your uh, website and I saw the technologies there, so there is that technology portfolio. But can you give us some examples of sectors of application of those technologies? Because Tiago already showed us uh, uh, what is the potential applications of, of, of the, the, the optical fiber that he developed on agriculture, on, on, on smart cities and managing infrastructures, whatever. But there are some hard technologies there to understand, but the applications, they, they might be huge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so for me, I, you know, I'll take a step back, right? So we look at it as two different uh, extremes, right? So one are, I've got this chip. I am a semiconductor expert. I know VHDL design. I have to go into the chip and make the transistor better, dip, uh, you know, make it on 130 nanometer node to whatever, right? So those are really technical folks who understand the technology way better than, than I will. So that's one group of startup founders who will come. Brilliant. You know, you understand it more than this. Go build it. There's the other group of uh, uh, startups we look at. It's like, I don't care what the chip does. You know, it's a nice little black box. All I am, I am a surgeon. I want to measure leakage currents happening in a heart implant. I, I, all I know is a chip. Yeah, I don't care about it. So here, have the prototype, measure the heart leakage current because you're an expert in, in surgery. I am not, right? And so, so we look at the both extreme to saying you don't have to be a technical expert at this technology to do it. If you are, if you are brilliant, go do it. If you're not, you don't need that expertise right now as a startup as well, because I'm going to give you a black box, which will do what you have to do. Uh, my throwaway example is always if you're building an app for um, on an iPhone, you don't have to understand how the iPhone is built, right? You're going to use the app. So, so those are the two extremes are how we address on the the persona of a startup founder right but to your question also before i answer it when i met tiago right he was giving me about Rayleigh scattering and how this uh, phase shift happens it was all oh, I, I have an electrical engineering degree but it's been sometimes i did not understand like where are you going to use it right so like, oh i can do humidity for semiconductor processing chocolate factory all right great let's explore this where the aha moment was was when he talked about concrete. Man, I've not researched so much of concrete till I was talking to you. Because he said, I can do humidity sensing when I pour concrete in. And for me, good entrepreneurs are, he went to the local hardware store, bought a bag of cement and mixed concrete and put the fiber in and measured it over three days. And three days later, he called me and said, hey man, it works, right? So for me, that is the proof of concept that you want to work on because you're looking at a problem to saying, hey, I, I have a brilliant solution. I don't know where it'll be used, but let's see for an early proof of concept, right? And so um, um, my old boss in Australia, he used to say, most of our stuff is like a light bulb. We know a light bulb exists, but we're searching for a dark room to saying, do you want a light bulb? Do you want a light bulb? In a, but that's how technology to see where the need looks at. So I'll do quickly before other questions. If questions come, I'll shut up and, uh, and I'll stop. Um, so we've got uh, something called as a structured laser beam, which is a technology that we developed at CERN to measure and optimize how the beams are. So we have, we can't, we have to have very precise so that otherwise the beams will miss or the efficiency is not there. So that laser, um, you can use any laser in the front. It's a lens combination. If you put it, you get perfectly beautiful laser light that you can use it for alignment. You can use for everywhere where laser works. And so that's one technology. Applications could be on, there's a startup currently working on 
marking and engraving and uh, on boxes and irregular shapes. So that application has been looked at. You can use it for communications. You can use it for alignment. So varied up. It's a platform. It's a laser. Uh, uh, optimize any laser. There's another one called the the single frequency Raman laser. Again, man, Tiago, today is optics day. Everything to dark with light. Um, so the second technology is um, a single frequency Raman laser. So it uses a diamond crystal to produce really pure spectra, which is tunable and all different wavelengths. That prototype I generally can't give because it costs about 50000 to make it now, but the aim is to put it in a chip that will go for $2. So that's the second thing. Again, applications. Uh, current use cases, we can pick a particular atom and move it using this laser, right? So when you want to, um, so in our experiments, we want to say, oh, I want to have these helium ions there or these exotic radio nucleus. You still have to find the spectrum match of them. And this produces a single spectrum and you can take it out from the Medicis experiment or whatnot. So it's installed at CERN. There's about six of them running at CERN. Uh, where can you use it? You can use it for communications again, filters, huge application, quantum applications as well. So that's the structured laser beam. Um, we've got one which is called uh, White Rabbit, which is a network switch. Um, this technology is hardware and software. It's open source. The first two actually have patents on it. This doesn't. Um, what it does is pre precise picosecond level timing control. This technology is now part of the IEEE uh, standard. Um, where you can have a single unity clock and you can match all of it on a single clock. Think about data centers where all of those clocks have to match and this does timing control beautiful. Um, it's used everywhere. Um, so that's, um, we did not know where it was being used. We know that it's also now used for nuclear fusion to do a lot more control over. And the accurate chip for me is, if you think about any device, it x-axis y-axis y-axis is current so if i'm doing um, insulin pump it'll say I, when this current goes here then trigger it to release the valve to give more insulin into your body right and that is in milliseconds that is measured now imagine what you can do at femtoseconds so that's 10 power 12 more uh, uh control for adding you know one dollar chip into your device um, which gives you a lot more control. You can trigger it a lot earlier and whatnot. So again, what we have is the light bulb. Um, we'll be looking as many as dark rooms as possible. If you ever think about having really accurate measurements and trigger controls, that accurate chip is fantastic. That's four. Um, one is called Rusio. Um, it's um, the, the the it's a software. The developer's sense of humor is it's named after Don Quixote's donkey, Rusio. Um, it can move large amounts of data between private cloud and public cloud. So if your data is at Amazon Web Services and if you want to use to my Microsoft Azure, it, it takes a lot of hard time to pull the data out and move it there. This is an open source software which can move those data much, much simpler on a single API call, but it helps you. It's a full data federation tool. Um, you can either build that into a commercial application, it's open source, or you can use it for your internal purposes. So if you're having a lot of data to move. Um, so that's a quick overview of our, our tech portfolio. Our aim is to get this. So if you saw, I have 50% of the funding to get this to about 12, 15 technologies in the next year. So anyone wants to put a question? We don't have any anyone uh, raising hands, but 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 I will. I, if you want, I I, I can continue. Please go ahead. I mean, I uh, I like talking. So, <laughs> so Tiago, I w I would like to ask you something, Tiago. When 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 you say you are a certain startup, uh, what is the impact that you have? Um, for instance, when you talk with a VC. Uh, or with a client, is that really differentiating for you? Do you do you think that it has? I think so, but uh, w w can you explain a little bit more? Yes. So, so the first impact is does CERN have startups? It's always the question. But why CERN has startups and so on? And so the first two three minutes is try to explain that at CERN we don't do only collisions. We do engineering mostly. 
at especially in the in the in headquarters there are a few uh, physicians they are mostly engineers they actually build technology and after they understand or the people understand that uh, CERN has this startup department of course it's always good to be associated to the largest research institute in the world because even though we are not associated with physics you heard about CERN uh, from uh, anyone heard about CERN from uh, in television or it was on eggs or whatever and uh, and then of course it also opens the door because my my collaboration with CERN is still open and uh, even a partner or even a possible investor also sees Fibersight as a bridge to CERN that is also really interesting for them. So, so I'll say that is all positive impact that I have uh, being a CERN startup. Uh, but even saying that the technology was born at CERN is already important for them because CERN has somehow a stamp of quality. And this also was passed to my company as well as the CERN startup. Okay, great. Um, Ash, I, I will also ask you another question. I think it's important because some of the participants might not only be the startups, but also organizations like IPN, which is also a business incubator. And as you mentioned, and as it is in the website, uh, we can be your partners. We can partner with you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how can we establish th this kind of partnerships? Uh, what What is expected? Uh, just to, to understand even for us a little bit better. Oh, absolutely. Look, I mean, for us, um, the way we started out was, you know, to get the anchor um, uh, partners who, who, who we wanted to get, right? And so, um, so that's gone through the face now because they were, for us, to, it was kind of a startup within a large organization, right? Because hey, you, you could imagine how many people told this would not work. So we went through this process and we are in the first year. Um, and uh, so it was our first test to say, would these people actually think we can pull this off? And those, so we went through those large players, small players, specific investors. So we've come through that phase of building that partnership of people who trust and saying, okay, this is good. Now for me, to be honest, the whole proof of the pudding is how many startups we get out of it, right? So I think I've got enough of a partnership to go forward, however, we're still looking at, you know, the whole design principle was how can I build one system that can work from everywhere, right? It doesn't matter if the startup is coming from Brazil now because Brazil is an associate country. And I, I don't know anything about happening in Brazil. So I've got one lead person in Brazil who's building, bringing together incubators, VCs who operate in that area, who know that ecosystem where I, even if I spend as much as time as possible, I would not be able to understand, right? And so, well, our open call is if, if you have a vibrant startup ecosystem, you know, reach out to us. There's a list on our website to partner as well, because I don't know a lot of people who have operated outside of what I know or what's in the news. So that's not necessarily the, the only people who help. So uh, we are not close to partnership. But right now, if you ask me, my top priority is to make sure I get more startups and then we keep on increasing the number of partnerships to get there. Right. So a big change from the previous system was that um, you're from Portugal, you have to go through this incubator in Portugal, you have to be uh, uh, joined there. So it was a very one size fits all. What we've looked at uh, the reverse is, here's a startup founder, we've given technology, they built a use case, they can go to market. If you want money, we introduce you to investors. If you say, I don't want incubation, I don't introduce you to incubators, right? And so. Um, the problem happened was previous startups, there was a uh, there was a founder who had exited three startups successfully, right? And he's put all of his money in his fourth startup. Uh, it was on a semiconductor chip, right? And then we had to say, you have to go to this incubator for us to give you this technology as a startup. He could teach that incubator how to do things, right? And so uh, he could teach me how to do entrepreneurship because he's done it three times more than I have done. So. So what we said was, it's not a set to saying that as a founder, you must go there. Of course, if you find somebody local to help you, that's always brilliant. But if the investor is from the UK, you should be able to raise money because talent is everywhere, but the opportunity doesn't exist necessarily locally. Um, so uh, 
sorry, long answer. Anybody interested to partners, please reach out to us. We'd love to partner. And any startup which you think works, or if you want to use uh, intros as well, happy to help anytime. Okay, so th this is, is nice to know from the, the incubator side, but also for, for the startups. I, I would challenge Jose and Tom, which is here from Ani. Hi, Jose. We didn't uh, agree on a question, but uh, uh, I think it's I think it's important because you come from uh, uh, ANI, which is the the National Innovation Agency, and from the 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 the, the policymakers and the policy implementation side, how will you see this this relationship between the ecosystems, the incubation, the startups, and um, you challenge us now. I'm giving back the challenge just to 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 kind of wrap up even a little bit about uh, the 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 webinar. Okay. If yeah, you don't feel you. comfortable, it's okay. But no, I you. think you will. No, totally fine. Yes, I think it's totally fair that you that you ask these questions. And um, so first, uh, my involvement in this is because I work as an industrial liaison officer with CERN. So I try to engage Portuguese industry with CERN. Um, I also have a, a very small finger on the knowledge transfer. I participate also on the knowledge transfer forum at CERN as Portuguese representative. But in fact, uh, ANI does not have a huge uh, direct role in, uh, in knowledge transfer in Portugal. So what we do is we rely a lot on the, on the network of uh, incubators and on sister agencies that do that kind of support. Of course, and he also has um, interaction with uh, many other actors in the, in the innovation field in Portugal. One of them is through now these new venture capital funds that uh, go uh, through the CFID uh, uh, tax incentive scheme. So there's, there's quite a few number of funds that you know a lot better than I do, uh, which are supposed to be investing in uh, uh, research and development intensive uh, companies and startups. So the ecosystem exists, but it's, uh, I think this uh, CERN Venture Connect maybe uh, gives um, a framework for some of the things that might be glued together by some of these actors, such as IPN and some other actors in the, in the field. So I think this, this is a nice introduction uh, to the, the potential that exists in some of those technologies. Of course, uh, not all of the knowledge transfer opportunities uh, at CERN will come from the CVC, right? Because if we look at uh, Ash's presentation today and we look at Tiago's, we would say that even if Tiago was there today, he would not be part of CVC because it's not one of the core technologies. Ash will correct me on that. Um, but there's always this limitation of uh, the, the the technologies in which CERN has uh, uh, identified the capacity, while well, the uniqueness of CERN and also the capacity to provide some technical expertise on it. So uh, I think it. Uh, I think it's uh, my take would be for people at IPN and some of the other actors in the Portuguese ecosystem to now discuss what kinds of possibilities exist for us to take advantage of this and also contribute to CERN's mission of uh, societal impact. But if I if I may also ask something to Ash, uh, Ash, because I'm curious, because on the heels of this comment that I was making about Tiago's technology and the match or no match with the, with the portfolio at CVC, um, I'm also curious to know because you you showed some numbers about the, the the ongoing negotiations that you have and some of the projects that might be already ongoing, and I'm curious to know what's the profile of those. Uh, is this mostly people who are already at CERN? Is it people who have a connection with a, with an existing uh, CERN big, or are these people that come just out of nowhere and uh, just just started interacting with you? So I'll add to the first one on the connection part of uh, Tiago. I mean, it's Tiago's technology, right? I mean, it's not part of CVC portfolio, right? So this is some, these are the ones who actually come out of CERN, who, who work on it at CERN, we give money to build prototypes, right? Because of the translation part that's required. Um, and the first CVC spin out, uh, the, this is post Tiago's time that CVC came out, is, uh, is again um, a, a chap who's built 
uh, an AI agent for reliability engineering. He spent 11 years at CERN. Again, you know, not part of the CVC portfolio because it's it's know-how, right? And so, so those are the spin-outs that are coming out, which which are not part of this portfolio because, I mean, um, if, uh, for example, Thiago was Andrea's one. It's like I can't license stuff that they already know in their head. Um, so that's the other part of you know outside of well, these are more sun spin outs coming out of sun to the the startups who are interested in stuff outside of this of course we will talk but it's more you have to know that it might not be hey i would like to work on superconducting material yes i'd love to you, i can help you with and make sure that we can talk with people but there is no guarantee they will be available to support you or what will happen so so that comes with a caveat to saying that, oh, Ash, you told me you'll you'll optimize time. I'm waiting for two months for this meeting to happen. And like, I told you, I can't guarantee you that. Just to make sure why we put these five technologies, because I can cross my heart and saying that I can give you. You can go read the video. I've got a video with the with the inventor so that you don't have to have a first call and wait for two months for that first call. I've already recorded that call. You can see that at your own pace. So that's where on those five technologies or six technologies, we can guarantee you that the tech transfer can happen immediately. I can give you the prototype because I can promise that. The others I can't hold a promise and I'm not promising that, right? And so that's the differentiation. Now, those numbers you saw are not startups. Those are partner agreements that we've signed like with Microsoft, like with VCs, right? And so my hope is next presentation, I don't talk about the partners and I talk about how many startups that we have. That's where the goal is because I mean, I'm, I lead entrepreneurship and it has to be about the entrepreneur, not the actors around it, right? So the man or woman in the middle is who we count and that's what the founders are. So the Diagos of the world. But to answer your question on who are those people, um, we've had uh, large uh, corporate venture capital like the Microsoft, specialist um, VCs who focus on a particular area like semiconductors, uh, hardware, uh, photonics, and they bring that ecosystem as well. So for example, one of our partners is in Netherlands who is part of the Eidnoven group. One square kilometer, you can find every company that does to do with anything to do with chips. I can't know all of them. I introduce you to them and they will introduce you to saying, you want to talk with NXP? This guy. You want to talk to Philips? This guy. Right. And so that helps on the network because I can't build that expertise inside. I, I partner with the smartest folks in that in that area. So folks like that who are part of ecosystem. Um, to give you a shocker, I have one law firm also as a partner. This was like went through, oh, why is a law firm there? because they offered that they will do free consulting with all of the startups on how to set up a entity, uh, look after their articles of incorporation, how hard it is to get Permi in Switzerland, what is the difference between SA and SARL, GMBH, and all of that. To be honest, if, if you have to go to a lawyer and talk to them, they're gonna charge you 500 euros an hour. This is, they said, first consulting is free. And I'm like, you're a friend to startups, come on in, right? And so again, if you have found, if within the ecosystem, if uh, if somebody comes, a Portuguese startup comes, or another Tiago at CERN says, hey, I want to do a Portuguese company setup. How do I do it? I said, I don't know. Talk to Tiago. Tiago, meet somebody like you so that they can help. So that's pretty much what the network we want to build, where people have their skill sets and know about what they're doing, and we can introduce them to do what they do, right? Uh, so that's pretty much where the where the partner network is. Of course, I want to push more on, you know, finding more entrepreneurs, and that's where all the effort is going right now. Okay, thank Great, you thanks. so much. So uh, I think we are sharp on time. Also, we 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 started sharp. We will finish sharp on time. Um, uh, I would like very much to thank Ashravi Kumar from Sun Venture Connect to from being here with us and explaining everything and open some new chapter of uh, cooperation possibilities, not only for the startups, uh, but also for the incubators. 
Tiago, thank you so much for your testimonial, for being here and giving voice to what happened with you and how this your technology is making a difference. Uh, José, thank you for the challenge, for the introductions and for for your participation. Um, thank you for everyone that attended to the team. And so we see you can catch up again uh, probably in December for another space webinar. So bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Take again. Care. Bye. See you. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you.